Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm Guy Callahan, uh, CEO of uh, Banjo Loans. We're going to kick off this presentation in probably, probably about a minute. We'll just give a couple more people a, few time, a minute to, to join in and then we'll, we'll, I'll kick it off with introductions and, and start the presentation. So just bear with us. Okay. All right. So I'm going to kick this off, and um, I see more people are joining. But that's that's great. They can join along. I know everybody's time's uh, valuable, and we're all busy. So I'm going to kick it off again. So my name is Guy Callahan. Um, I am the CEO of Banjo Loans. Um, I'm very very fortunate. I've got Patrick Coglin here, the CEO of Creditor Watch. Um, so. Banjo Loans, we, we provide working capital loans out into the Australian SME market. Um, we work really closely with Creditor Watch on a lot of uh, areas, particularly in gathering data and analysing our business owners when we're when we're assessing for our loans. So it's a, it's a super important relationship to us uh, and we're always really happy to um, to, to work with Credit Watch as much as we can throughout the journey and we, and we do a lot of stuff together and this is just a, a, another insight into some of the stuff we do together. So welcome Patrick. Thanks Guy and thanks uh, yeah to, to Bandra for organising this. Always good to uh, to join these sort of events and, and love working with you as well. Um, just just as a really brief intro, yeah, Credit Watch is a commercial credit reporting agency so we're providing credit risk information, credit risk tools for, uh, for, for anyone who's offering terms, whether it's B2B trade or, uh, or, or lending like, uh, like Banjo does. So um, great to be working with you, Guy, as always. Thanks, mate. Thanks. Um, all right. So now I'll, I'll put a uh, disclaimer out there at the moment, everybody. I, I had man flu last week, so I was knocked down. So if I cough during this presentation, um, you can't get infected from me, but uh, I've got a cough that's still lingering around. Um, so it's a bear with me if that happens. Um, so what, what we're going to do is I'm going to run through um, our presentation uh, today, which is every year we go out and we engage an external consulting agency and, and we uh, interview five to six hundred um, five to six hundred SME owners throughout Australia, and we ask them. A lot of questions around what their thoughts are with the Australian economy, what their um, major concerns are, uh, what how they went last year, what what um, they did that helped them be successful, um, and 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 a bit of the outlook for the for the year ahead. So we we do that um, every year, uh, and so what I'm going to do is run through the report today, just just uh, through the highlights from the report. Look, which we found. Um, yeah, find it really fascinating and, and, it, and it's a good report and it gives us a good insight into what our clients are thinking um, and so we can position some of the stuff that we do um, as an SME as well out, out to our clients. Um, so throughout it, look, um, Patrick might join in at, at some stage and just sort of uh, have a chat and sort of see what that, give his insights into what credit or what you're experiencing as well. All right, so I'm going to launch this. Let me just hopefully... Patrick, you can tell me. Yeah, looks good. All right, awesome. Okay. All right, so what I'm going to go through here is um, just at a, at a high level. So I'm going to try and keep this moving so that we don't sort of get caught um, bogged on any too much detail. Going to look at the current landscape. What's powering SMEs for 2022? Um, how a lot of businesses are leveraging and using finance to help them accelerate their growth. Um, and then some, some, just some key little issues that, that people are uh, experiencing at the moment, particularly in the SME market compared to um, our larger corporate friends. All right. Okay, so interestingly, um, 
over half of SMEs after sort of that, that two, 220 and 221 with our lockdowns and stuff like that are actually exceeding their revenue targets, um, which is more up from when we did this report a year ago. Um, and as you can see, things like hospitality and construction, um, sorry, hospitality and construction were the least likely to do, but most people on a whole were achieving and going above their revenue targets, which is pretty exciting. And uh, Guy, I might just jump in there. Sorry to jump in so early, but I, the, the hospitality and the um, construction is really interesting because we're, we're sort of seeing those two as the two of the you know the biggest sort of struggling uh, industries ourselves through our data. Yeah, yeah, and and it's and it's been uh, publicised in the media a lot, Patrick, and it's and it's really is coming to life, and we see it in our loan books as well. Um, the one, one thing that was really key that came out from here is, is that businesses that actually prepared and invested for growth, even when things were struggling, were the ones that are the ones that have come out the other side growing really hard. Um, and most of the people here that that that, that tried to, to improve for their growth are investing in new technology. Yeah. And the other ones that they were doing was new assets, so buying new assets and equipment. Um, and then improving their products that they were doing. But technology, you'll see this throughout, that um, people who invested in technology for growth were the ones that really have started to shine in so far in 2022. Um, again, and, and it come, comes back to the same same point, those that exceeded their revenue targets, you know, so, and a lot of them did, so th over 30% of SMEs exceeded their revenue targets for a year, which is quite interesting coming out of the pandemic, took the actions of investing in the technology, assets, and increasing headcount um, as they're starting to grow and come out of that other side. However, look, there are still headwinds, and 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 I know any of you on the uh, on the call here today will, will be understanding and 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 this, and the and the main one is still economic and market conditions. Um, and I know just chatting with Patrick before, the main thing people are concerned about is uh, what happens if we go back into another lockdown. Um, most people have started to prepare for where they're going, but what's going to happen if there's, you know, if the market really crashes and the things out of our control um, take take uh, take precedence and and really start to dictate how the market's going? Yeah, it seems that everyone, a lot of businesses are, have operated really lean as a result of the last two years, so they're in fantastic positions. You know, if we we put sort of funding, I guess, to the side, and and whether there's, you know. Uh, the same size market out there, depending on what industry they're in, but they're all operating very lean, whether that's, you know, through technology investment or if they've had to, unfortunately, you know, scale down on, on people. Um, it's, you know, it's it, like you said, it's the lockdown that scares people more. If it's just, you know, tough economic conditions, there's a general feeling out there. And um, in the market from, you know, CEOs and business owners and senior managers that just feel like, can't be worse, you know, even if we went into a recession, can't be worse than being locked down for two years, you know? So I think there's, there's a lot of uh, bullish confidence out there, which is good. Yeah, look, it is good. And, and, and again, we're, we're seeing that with, with all of our clients that we deal with. I, I just want to remember everyone, if if, um, if you've got any questions that, that get raised throughout this presentation, please send them through via the chat um, on, on the, on you know, through the go-to webinar. Uh, chat and we'll, we'll compile them at the end and Patrick and I can see if we can address them. Right, um, even though, you know, so the market conditions, so inflation is, is going to be an issue, everyone's there, but but look, it, just as Patrick said, what I've found, even though people are concerned that it's going to be a barrier to growth, most people have actually started to prepare for that. And I think this shows how um, business owners, SMEs in Australia, really got their finger on the pulse on, on what they need to do um, in the market and have actually started to prepare by increasing their prices or perhaps reducing costs where they can to, to, to counter for that. Um, yeah, yeah. So look, yeah, retail. This is probably where we're, um, you know, we're starting to see some people um, really start to sort of hurt and 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 understand sort of um, different areas where we break it down into different areas and different um, 
team. So retail is one that's really concerned about inflation. I mean, they've been hammered at any rate because of the um, pandemic, but then they're even more concerned about inflation and how they're going to counter that. And again, hospitality, our other friends who have taken a, a, a pretty big hit, they're pretty concerned about inflation as well. Not as large as retail, but they're still really concerned. You know, they, these are the two key areas that, that were really hit um, throughout the market um, with the lockdowns. Patrick, just, just sort of going to you at the moment. So you, we, we don't, when we do the data, we don't look at it geographically, but I know, I know you guys do. Have you, have you sort of noticed anything in pockets of regions and stuff like that that are, that are concerned or that are coming out strong? Yeah, so so we put out our business risk index on a, on a monthly basis, with, which basically does two things. It ranks um, all regions around Australia. There's about 300 odd, they, they call it an SA3 level, but the best way to think about it is sort of local government council, maybe slightly bigger, slightly, slightly smaller, depending on the area. And we rank them from, from best to worst. And, and there's a couple of regions that sort of jump out um, for concern. First of all, Regional is regional and rural are, are, are doing really well, which which is great to see. And it's actually the capital cities that there's a lot more pressure on. So uh, Brisbane's the worst, then then Victoria, uh, sorry, then Melbourne, um, Sydney, um, Adelaide, and, and Adelaide and Perth performing really nicely, which which is good. But um, Brisbane's traditionally been a, the riskier of the of the capital cities, and and Melbourne and Sydney have been quite similar. But um, Melbourne's jumped for, for obvious reasons after the you know the sort of horrendous two years that they've had there um, and then if we if we go even more granular than that there's, there's sort of two key regions that have done it extremely tough over the last sort of 18 months one is the sort of gold coast cool and gather um, region and, and the sort of shires yeah. around that you know obviously really reliant on on tourism and lots of domestic yeah. tourism going there now which is fantastic to see but it doesn't make up for the um the international tourism that they're missing out on there's also cost pressures up there you know as um as property prices go up and, and rents go up too and then the other region is um, Western Sydney. Um, so, so that really kicked off when they had their, their extended, or they under a lot of strain when they had that extended sort of localised lockdown there, which started you know midway through last year. Um, and that they're still not recovering from that. So they're, they're the two like sort of bigger regions that we're, we're focusing on at the moment. Yeah, okay. It's just interesting, when we did this report, so we did, um, and it's not in this in the report here, but we, we there was an actual flight to businesses setting up in Queensland um, in 20, 20 and 2021, funnily enough, because uh, of all the lockdowns. Now we're seeing it starting to flow back the other way, which is quite, which is quite interesting. Um, so I don't know if they're, they're setting up their temporary. You know, people were going up there and just sort of setting up their offices temporarily, and now coming back. But it's yeah, it, that, that's interesting. Alrighty. Um, <clears throat> so look, there are still some. Um, barriers of growth, as I said, but as we really pointed out, the optimism within business owners is really high. It's still really, really high and, and they're, they're hopeful of where the business can go. And, and so I'm I'm pretty um, pretty strong, pretty robust about where the Australian SME market is going, um, which I think bodes well for us for in the future for the next couple of years. Um, you know, there's gonna be some tough times, but it's, it's still looking quite good. So what's going to be powering our growth in 2022? Um, again, no, there's no no real um, mysteries here and, and key things that, that, are, that are standing out. Um, improving people's products and how they offer it to the market um, is, is still key. Right? It's, it's growing, it was, it was strong last year, but it's even stronger again this year. Um, investing in technology, as I've said, uh, said already, is, is is just super strong and, and we're seeing that um, in a lot of the stuff that we do with funding and, and the new technology that people are doing and then going ahead and launching new marketing campaigns to try and drive revenue is is something that's that's super strong as well. Um, what we noticed during 2020 and 21 as the lockdown sort of bit in our major cities a lot of people really increased their online revenue so driving sales through online means instead of having um, foot traffic come to their store or whatever it might be. That has continued again, um, continued again throughout 2021 and, and then early into 22. Uh, and look, I, I see this trend continuing um, unabated for, for a while yet. 
Yeah, I think the big challenge in that space now is the supply chain issues, isn't it? There's there's still a still a um an appetite for it. It's actually delivering the goods on time. It feels like they uh, retail can't really catch a break after being shut. They move everything online, and then all of a sudden they've now got challenges of delivering it. Oh, absolutely, and um, I think uh, look, we'll touch on that in, in a bit later on, on what people are starting to do for their supply chain, but that's. That is the major concern, I think, not just domestically but globally. Um, what, sorry, what we're saying here is, is we're still seeing businesses sort of acquiring other businesses for growth. Um, so that's still growing, and that was that was sort of growing last year as well, but it's it's growing again. And so people are either merging with with, with ones that have done it tough, emerging, or uh, they're actually looking to acquire their competitors to continue their growth transition. And looking at different ways, because uh, things are getting harder and tougher, um, looking at different ways that they can add value to the customer. So what can they do to keep a customer there, to sorry, attract a customer and to keep them keep them there? So different things like um, what, what are value adds that we can do? How can we increase our product offering? Just give slightly different twists to our products and what we're gonna do. Um, and then just continually driving profit and revenue through the business. So this is kind of where Banjo fits in a little bit here. So we, you know, we do our working capital solutions. So we, we, this is something of interest to us and in, in how businesses finance their growth. Um, and what what was sort of found throughout is that businesses still um, look to leverage funding to help drive their growth. So so two thirds of businesses are looking to some form of funding to help them to push their in, in, on top of their cash flow to help them drive their growth and get them to where they're going. Um, at the moment, you know, you can see that banks are still 33% because they're the traditional funders um, and where people turn to. But, but what you'll find and, and what the report sort of shows as we go through it is people are actually understanding there's, there are alternate options out there for them now. Um, when people are looking for funding for their growth, no surprise here, particularly in the market, um, interest rate or price is the still most important factor. Um, and this is where we start to now see that people are starting to get a little bit concerned around interest rate increases. Um, but as I pointed out um, at the start, most SME owners are, are really switched on and they're, they're, they're well and truly prepared for what's going ahead and they've started to factor in some of the, those interest rate um, interest rate rises. And the other sort of um, key, key things there are like speed, of getting their funding or you know the opportunity cost of not having it and then the ease of going through applications. Um, so, so and again touching back to where that, that bank was there that 33% those secured business loans um, are still the number one finance product that most people use and, and I think this is more a fact that it's traditional so people go, they feel they've got a relationship with their bank, so they go there and they try and get get uh, a secured loan against uh, property or um, even, even if they might not want to do that, they'll still go and, and, and do that because that's the traditional way that they go and, get, and uh, obtain their funds. Um, however, nearly two thirds of businesses have found challenges when it comes to attaining their funding. And this is where, what I said before, the opportunity cost of a lot of businesses of not getting the funding when they needed is starting to outweigh um, the, that, that the flip side of trying to find the cheapest price. Um, you know, it's the time taken to achieve funding is, is, is the biggest driver here. Looking, searching and searching for that suitable interest rate. Sometimes it's there, sometimes it's not. Um, and then the having to supply um, security for a, a funding option is 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 a is a bit of a, a detriment now as well. And what we're now starting to find is that a lot of SMEs are looking for alternatives to the banks, and they're looking at how they can leverage the cash flow of their business rather than going and putting their house up for um, for security or their um, whatever assets they might have um, up and up for security. Um, but they're looking for different ways that they can get funding so that they can actually get, you know, that there's more, there's faster and more efficient options 
achieving the funding that they want for growth. Recruitment challenges. Um, so let's just talk through here. So, so look, we're no different in this environment, and I know SMEs here, uh, it would be exactly the same. Finding the right people in this environment and, and keeping them is really, really tough, you know, particularly in things like technology and that side of things where you've got everybody scrambling for resources and, and the larger corps are paying pretty good money for people to uh, go and jump ship to jump on with them. Um, the market's being closed, you know, we haven't had um, immigration coming in for a while. Um, and so, so there's, there's less supply out there. So everyone's finding it really difficult at the moment. And, and as you can see, you know, 33% are finding it difficult, but yet hospitality and manufacturing are finding it even more so because they just haven't had the supply that they've needed. Um, however, most people are really keen to hire. Yeah, so everybody's looking to hire. Uh, Patrick and I were just talking about, um, before we jumped on the line, um, we're exactly the same. We're, we're, we're rapidly, running out of real estate as, as an office space as we as we want to hire and I, and I know talking to Patrick he's, he's a little bit the same so businesses that, that are growing they really still want those recruits so we're working really hard um, to, to find the right people for our business and it's just yeah, it's taking longer so we've just got to be ahead of the curve of where we've got to go. And I think Guy on that I'm pretty sure our, our chief economist shared a stat recently it was something like there were there were 400,000 vacancies you know available within Australia last month but only only 7,000 got filled you know just you know tiny percentage so a huge, huge amount of demand out there good good time to yeah. be um good good time to be a, an employee but um it's funny then you look at specific industries and it feels like it might be turning a little bit particularly around you know if you look at the the, the tech world um, with with some of the you know the redundancies and whatnot being being made around you know around the world in some of the larger organisations, even profitable ones. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting, isn't it? Look, um, and and hopefully that'll kind of that that ease will start to flow on to 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 the SMEs as well because they're, they're the ones that usually sort of feel the pain the most um, yeah. because they can't they can't, can't offer some same perks and. Um, wage wage growth that, that, that a larger corp can. Um, and, and look, we're the same here, you know, what, what can you do to overcome the recruitment challenges of, of where we're going, right, so, and, and what we're doing, and that, that flexible working environment is something that's key for people. I'm, I'm not sure where we're going to end up with um, the work from home environment. Um, I, I, what I'm finding now is, is there is a, a bit more of a fight to coming back into the office because of the collaboration and the innovation and stuff that happens within there. Well, what's what's your thoughts on that, Patrick? Yeah, look, we've I've always been a work from a work from office um, advocate, um, even pre pre pandemic. And and as lockdown sort of would come off through the last two years, we would get we would get staff back in. Um, we put a huge amount of effort into our culture and I think it's very difficult to maintain that when everyone's working from home so so we're currently three days three days a week in the office and um and unless it's being filtered before it gets to me um everyone seems quite happy with that and that's across you know Sydney Melbourne Brisbane offices works for us but at the same time we we, we do a we, we offer a lot of uh perks and and other sort of flexible arrangements like you know wellness days once well, wellness day once a month and put lunch on yeah, sort of two days a week and coffees as well. So um, there's a huge there's a huge amount of effort that goes into that. You know, people talk about culture. It's not something that you 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 can take for granted. You really have to work hard at it. It's so true. It's so true. And, and look, I found like, um, you know, before the pandemic, it was, we, you know, you had a great culture and then you continued that on for a time. But then uh, as you start to have longer and longer away out of the office and, and working in silos, that, that culture can take a hit. So we're, we're the same with you. We, we've got three days back in the office and it's, it's working pretty well. And you, you, But you've got to be innovative about how you can get people more engaged. Um, but I noticed the collaboration and the, and the innovation when people were back in the office and just, the, you know, just people, we're, we're um, social animals. So we, we want to engage and talk with people. 
that's it's important. Yeah, you know, yeah, people seem much happier. Yeah. I, I think there's always going to be people who are adamant want to work from home, and but there's going to be you know as many, if not more, that want to work from the office. So it, it feels like we're in that sort of balancing period at the moment. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. It's going to be interesting to, to see where it ends up. Um, right, yeah, so the, the, probably one, you know, we're sort of getting to the, towards the end of the presentation, but the, you know, the big thing in the news at the moment, and Patrick alluded to it a little bit earlier too, is um, supply chain issues that we're, that we're seeing, uh, not only um, domestically but globally at the moment, and, and they, cause, they are causing issues for, for everybody around the place. Um, so as, as you see, look, you know, nearly half of people have been either moderate, moderately or severely impacted by supply chain issues in the past year. Um, and once again, manufacturing and retail have been the hardest hit by, by that. And, and um, it's, it's really, um, yeah, it's, it's been, it was really noticeable, I think, last Christmas started looking at people getting planning ahead for the year. And they weren't just planning for this Christmas coming, but they're also starting to plan for the Christmas ahead. Um, so you delayed local or interstate, interesting enough, with the, with the deliveries were the main issue of the past year. So people finding issues just getting the stock that they need. Um, God, I'll give you a classic example. I, I ordered some um, recycling bins six weeks ago and they only just arrived last week and they fold up recycling bins uh, for paper. So, you know, there's, there are just issues experienced everywhere across there. So what people are having to do is just plan well ahead um, of, of of where they're going and what they need to to really get ahead there. So uh, a lot of the business owners we're doing, talking to, they're purchasing more stock. So that the old thing of um, just in time is sort of nowhere near as prevalent as before, um, particularly when you're talking with with retailers and clothing manufacturers, um, looking at different suppliers people can use, actually paying more for stock and materials so they know they get it there. Um, and just instead of doing bulk purchases, just continually ticking and adding adding stuff into the thing, uh, into their into their um, into their supplies. So it's people are just like I said, becoming more innovative and adapting to the situation, but planning ahead. And it's quite interesting in that you know those sort of retailers, big e-com providers through the pandemic who who ordered more when when the pandemic hit did extremely well, you know, whereas those who were conservative um, and not didn't know what, you know, what was coming, understandably, um, you know, didn't fare as well because they couldn't get their hands on stock. And you're kind of starting to see a little bit of the inverse, a little bit, particularly in the retail yeah. sector where you've now got um, retailers who, who have got too much stock. So it's, it's, it's just so, so challenging, you know, so, so, so hard for people at the moment to, to get, to get that right because, um, you know, things change so quickly. <laughs> Excuse me, yeah, 100%, 100%. Um, all right, look, just coming up to summarise, and then we've got some questions that have come through. Whoops, yeah, that went through uh, pretty quickly. Um, so, yeah, look, a lot of businesses are actually achieving or exceeding their revenue targets, well over half, which is great. Um, two thirds of businesses, and particularly the ones that are, are really succeeding, uh, leveraging funding to help them drive to get to the next stage. Um, again, two thirds of businesses actually faced some challenges when they were trying to obtain their funding, so they're looking at alternate funding to get there, which is, which is, which is you know good for us. But um, it's something we can sort of talk about more. Um, nearly two thirds of businesses are looking to hire additional staff in the next twelve months. So we're all looking for those right resources in the SME market, which is which is fascinating. And a third of businesses are actually purchasing more stock earlier than what they had to do um, previously, leading into into the um, into the pandemic. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I think that did did that work, Patrick? Yeah. Yep. Cool. All right. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. I've got a few questions that have come through, and so I'm just going to uh, read them out. Ella has helped me a lot. Um, and Patrick, what, what we might do is we might uh, sort of bounce these between the two of us um, and, and go through. So first of all, thanks very much for the questions, people. And thanks thanks uh, for, for listening here. So what sort of technologies um, are business investing in that are driving growth? 
Um, it's it, look, it's it's mixed and varied. So I'm finding, and Patrick, I'm not sure if you're seeing anything, but we're seeing people improve their marketing systems, their ordering, purchasing systems, um, even their accounting software. Right, looking at what how they can integrate their accounting software with their online solutions. Uh, and then the other side we're seeing is in technology is how can they produce their products and services better? So their products particularly, you know, on the right right asset side of things. Anything you're yeah. seeing there, Patrick? Yeah, look, from, from, our, from our perspective, it's all about automation. So not, not necessarily, you know, removing people from, from the equation, though that, that's definitely one of the, um, you know, one of the, the outcomes of it. But you know, from a customer service perspective, nowadays everyone expects to be able to, you know, get a decision instantly, find the information instantly, whether they're Googling something or to some of the points that have come up in your, um, in the, the the Compass report, you know, speed speed of application, right? Speed to get funds. So um, automation via API in particular is is probably one of the most requested things that, that we're seeing from, from our customer base who are ultimately um, you know, B2B uh, suppliers or, or lenders. Yeah, okay. yep, cool. All right, so the next one's for me, and then there's one particularly for you, Patrick, or there's a couple. Jeez, you're, you're popular actually today. Um, all right, so how do we think lending may change now that interest rates are rising, and, and what are we seeing from Andrew's end? So um, we actually, what we've found is that most people have realised that uh, they've been in this amazing low interest environment for a really, really long time. And most businesses are well and truly prepared that their cost of funding is, is going to go up. Um, so again, like people were planning for supply chain issues and recruitment issues and stuff like that, the people are actually already planning for interest rate rises. Um, but they know that there's a massive opportunity cost if they don't get the funding they need now and it won't, it'll hold them back from their growth. So we're not actually seeing um, a detrimental effect from the interest rate rises. We just know that people have already planned for additional expense um, and are, are more concerned if they don't have the funding to grow. You know, when you've got two thirds of businesses really pushing hard to grow, it's, you know, that, that the funding's needed. Um, one for you, Patrick. Is there anything Creditor Watch is seeing from the data that tells them about the sentiment of businesses with the current economic circumstances? So, look, pro probably not. So, we we don't we haven't we don't survey or, or measure you know um, you know consumer or, or commercial sentiment. However, what what we know is there are certain statistics that we pick up or data points that we pick up that show. That there's you know an increase in trade for example so credit inquiries is a key one there and that's essentially a, a creditor whether they're a lender or a, a trade credit provider right providing goods or services to, to another business um, running running a report a credit report on you know on an applicant or an existing customer and they're usually doing that so that they can you know understand should i be giving credit you know should i be working with this company should i should i increase credit so that's a, what I call the sort of heartbeat of, of B2B trade. And we've, we've seen that just continue to increase pretty much month on month where our, um, our May stats will be out, but that, that May is always a, a fantastic month um, in Australia for, for, uh, for business. So that's a key one. There's definitely the appetite there to provide goods on, um, on account, which is, which, is really, which is really positive because, um, you know, it's rare that you can actually pay for things up front, you know, and uh, Banjo obviously yeah. can uh, can fill that gap between, you know, receiving receiving the goods and, and ultimately selling it. So yeah, that, yeah. Well, while we're not directly doing it, we're certainly seeing an increase in in that sort of uh, that trade. The other thing we're seeing is an increase in in overall receivables. So we we will um, integrate with accounting software packages and and also um, capture receivables from larger organisations via their age trial balance, and, and we've seen. Um, over the last two years, but particularly when JobKeeper came to an end, it sort of fell away about 40% year on year, but we're starting to see that creep back up to, to pre-COVID level. So like you said, revenue revenue is exceeding targets and, and starting to return to, to pre-COVID levels, which is fantastic. Yeah, that's good. Um, and just following on from, the, from that there, are, are you expecting to see an increase in insolvencies um, in the current 12 months? And, and, and if so, what industries do you expect to see that from? And I know because I know uh, the ATO is now starting to 
tighten the not tighten the noose, but tighten their uh, their tracking and um, yeah. following up. So, what what are you expecting to see there? Yeah, definitely. I mean, we you know for the last two years, two and a half years now, you know, it's, it's essentially we've been down sort of forty percent uh, year on year from from pre COVID insolvency levels. Um, so we're we're definitely they have to go back to um, at least pre COVID levels. So we will see an increase. Um, we think it'll be a, a staggered increase rather than a you know a sharp a sharp one back up. It may go above above where we were at you know pre COVID, but there's you know there's quite a few what I would call oh, zombie businesses. I don't like using that term anymore. We I think we overdid it, but businesses essentially aren't trading. You know I think if you walk through the CBDs, you see lots of um, cafes, restaurants, retailers who who just never opened back up and have been closed for. For, for months and months and months, and and they probably actually haven't been put through the formal administration yet. So so yes, we are expecting an increase, um, and and that'll start to you know really show th this month and and through you know July. Well, I think we just needed to get past obviously the uh, the, the federal election. On on the ATO side of things, um, they they've made a lot of noise, and and I've got I've got young kids, and and this is the sort of analogy that I use that when we play hide and seek, I don't want to. I don't want to find them and scare them. So I tell them, you know, dad is coming, here I come, you know, ready or not, just so they can hear me walking down the path or down <laughs> the, uh, the hallway. And I think the ATO has done a very similar thing in that, you know, late, late last year, they said, okay, we're going to start collections again, right? You know, they, they basically stopped in, in March, April, 2020. We're going to start collections again. That was the sort of first warning, you know, collections are going to start back up. We won't wind up. And then more recently, they had the headline number of 50,000, you know, direct penalty notices that have been issued. Um, they're starting to lodge um, ATO tax defaults. So if, if you owe $100,000 or more and are 90 days overdue and aren't engaged with the ATO, they are starting to register a tax default on, on um, the Credit or Watch credit report. So yep. now, again, that we're past the, um, the federal election, they, they will start to wind companies up and, and there's a, a couple that are already starting to come through in the statistics that we can see. So, so they, they're the biggest creditor, that, that they account for more uh, you know, wind-ups administrations than, than any other creditor. Um, and the big banks will, will, will probably follow suit as well, provided the economy doesn't um, sort of tip into a, into a recession and you know, inflation and whatnot takes over. If that occurs, I think they'll then pull back ultimately. Yeah, 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 okay. Okay, thanks, Patrick. Uh, all right, so it's so a last question uh, for this morning, guys, and, and thank you very, very much for the questions and, and participation. So, just wondering if we're seeing an increase in demand and funding, particularly with the challenges in the employment market and um, supply chains. The interesting, um, look, it's hard, to, hard to tell. Really, we're on a bit of, you know, our, our loan book is growing, and and there is continual growth. Um, and demand is stro really strong at the moment, um, but I think that's more uh, people preparing for where they need to be um, and people being optimistic about where they're going with the business. I, I think people are really aware that the economic conditions are going to be tough in the, in the, in the guise of inflation and supply chain and um, you know pricing, so they've, they've factored that stuff in and, and they're starting to, to grow hard because they want um, you know, they, they want their business to grow and exceed where they're coming from. Um, May, and just to give you a bit of an idea, May, May and June have been particularly strong um, in saying that. Um, and, and in fact, the, all the months this year have been relatively strong and good, apart from April, where we had so few business days. We had like, I think it was like 13 business days and we had school holidays and Easter and an election coming up and everyone was like, whoa, and just sort of stopped. So apart from April, you know, things have really, um, it's, sh it's showing a strong confidence from SMEs on where, where they're going with their business, which, which is good. Um, and they're planning and preparing, um, which is really fantastic. All right. Um, I, I, there's no, no further questions, but look, um, I, I really want to thank everybody for, for dialing into the presentation today and, and of course for sending through those questions. That's, um, it's fantastic to get the participation in there and get the feedback in there. Um, obviously, I want to take the opportunity to thank Patrick again. Um, Creator Watch is a, a super valued partner of ours and um, we enjoy doing all these, these um sessions with with creditor watch and combining with their business insights with with what we're finding 
Um, it just really helps give a really clear picture of what's going on out there in the market at the moment. So thank yeah, you, thanks, Patrick. Thanks for having us. Or, or yeah, we love love being part of this, and I love the uh, the yeah, I'll say informal nature. Still very professional. It's nice to be able to sort of just chat through it as well, rather than it being um, too much of a, a slideshow. So thanks, thanks, guys. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. All right, everybody. Thank you very much for your time today. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks a lot. Thank you.